I too will maybe move around, but I might also hide behind here. <laughs> um, I'm uh, actually going to pick up on something that, that, that Craig said uh, about the difference between um, intellectually understanding the, the, the crisis and uh, uh, understanding it in our gut. And I also want to actually address Hillary's question. Um, uh, those are both really sort of great places to uh, to go because she was talking about, um, uh, I think, the sort of artistic transformations that are necessary. Um, but I'm going to start by talking about uh, my childhood. Um, I grew up uh, on the Canadian prairies, uh, about 200 miles north of Minot, North Dakota. Um, it's brutally cold in the winters, so when springtime came around and when school let out, uh, my dad would pile all of us kids into the car and we would drive like crazy for two days until we reached the Rocky Mountains. And that's where we took our summer vacations. Um, it, was, it was wonderful. I, I, I have great memories of those, uh, those trips. I remember one in particular where we had gone up to Jasper National Park um, and we were driving south towards Banff. And suddenly my dad pulls us off to the side of the road. And uh, we go down this sort of gravel incline into this sort of blasted area of, of black screen where the nothing is growing. And uh, there's other cars parked out here. Um, so we parked and got out. And I, you know, I'm looking around, what, where the heck are we? And I look up and a quarter mile away from us is a glacier. The, the foot of the Columbia ice fields, which is a massive formation, far bigger than any mountain, um, extends for, I don't know, dozens of miles. Um, and we were right there. So we started to walk out towards it, the whole family, um, with some other tourists who were doing the same thing. And uh, as we were walking along the path, I noticed there's a little sign about this tall by the side of the path. And it had a number on it. It said 1923. We walked on a little further, and there was another little sign. And it said something like 1938. And a little further on was another sign that said 1945. And um, these signs continued all the way up to the foot of the glacier. The latest one said something like 1968. The year, by the way, was 1971. Um, so I turned to my dad and I said, what are all these signs? And he said, these are where the glacier used to be in those years. So at the age of nine in 1971, I had my first encounter with the monster that we now call global warming. Um, and in a sense, I have known about it since that very day. But only in a sense, and, and, and that's really what I want to talk about. Um, the, the global climate was, at that point in my life, too big to see. And the thing about it is that it's still too big to see. Uh, Timothy Morton has a concept uh, he calls the hyper-object. The climate is a, uh, a hyper-object. It's too big to be experienced directly, but it actually exists. It is um, uh, a force that influences nearly everything that happens on the Earth, but we don't see it. We see weather. We see uh, seasons. We see glaciers. Um, the question is, uh, how do we engage with something like that, with a hyper-object? Um, when we can't represent something like that directly. Now, and this is, um, this is a, an artistic question that I'm asking. It's uh, a vitally important question for all of us, um, uh, for our survival. But let's start with the, the artistic side of it. Um, I can't paint the climate, and I can't paint global warming. I can make images of specific things that happen to specific people. 
But the problem is that each of those can be interpreted as just that thing. So I can make um, uh, an image of a flood, but that's just a flood if I want it to be just a flood. Um, it's just an early spring if I want it to be just an early spring. Um, it's easy to simply turn your back, no matter how bad the crisis gets, because it is only ever manifested in these events, in, in the specific tornadoes, hurricanes, um, wildfires, and so forth, that, that make it up. A hyperobject can't be seen directly, and it can't be represented. So, I want to talk about that. I want to talk about how, then, we deal with um, a hyperobject like the climate artistically and how we <coughs> engage with it. And I'm going to give you an example from my latest book. This is a great opportunity for my, me to plug my latest book. Um, so I'm definitely going to do that. Um, but uh, um, I'm going to give an example, and I'm going to suggest that uh, if we can find ways to engage with um, hyperobjects on the grand scale on which they also operate, we have the opportunity not just to um, deal with them or cope with them, but to um, transform not just the world but ourselves. Uh, one thing that keeps coming up again and again in, in the, the climate discussion is despair and how all we can do is fight back. Now, I'm going to give you an example of a transformational concept, an idea that's represented as art and could be represented as a real thing that flips this entirely on, on its head to turn uh, this moment in time into perhaps the greatest spiritual opportunity that humanity has ever faced. Um, let's see if I can do it. <laughs> um, I'll start off though by talking a little bit more about uh, hyperobjects. Um, so the climate, as I've said, uh, can be seen as a hyperobject, too big to see. Uh, but uh, we think by examples, so I'll give you another example. Um, Benjamin Bratton's concept of the stack. Um, there's a book that he's written called The Stack. And uh, the stack is the, uh, again, global, universal uh, information ocean in which we now swim. It's uh, not just the internet, but the internet plus the fiber optic networks that tie it together, the cloud computing platforms that run our financial institutions, the Internet of Things systems that uh, allow bridge abutments to communicate the health of the bridge to um, uh, city planners, the, the smart cities, the cell phone networks, all of this forms a giant interconnected system that is itself too big to see, too big to grasp. When you think of something that is far larger than the internet, how do you think about that? Um, even William Gibson's concept of cyberspace uh, would just be, cyberspace would just be a small part of the stack. And yet the stack, even though we can't see it, uh, constrains and affects everything we do in our lives. It is literally the transnational entity that runs the world right now. And it's not a human being. And it's not even run by any particular group of human beings. It is its own thing. It would be nice if you thought it was some kind of dark, evil, um, uh, artificial intelligence. But you know what? It isn't even that. So who here has read a science fiction book or any kind of a book about the stack? You've, you've read maybe books about cyber, cyberspace, about uh, virtual reality and so forth, but the stack itself, which is the real thing, remains invisible. And because it's invisible, we can't directly engage with it. We, again, engage only with its manifestations. 
um, our cell phone providers, for instance. So hyper objects are out there. They're real. They have a, a massive impact on us, but we don't have the capacity as individuals to experience them. Um, this creates a major problem when you're dealing with a hyper object that is out to kill you. And that's the situation that we face with the global climate. So, as artists, how do we deal with this? Well, um, the, the obvious thing is, of course, we can take what the scientific community is, is, is telling us and we can represent it in various different ways. But this is the whole point. Representation fails when you're dealing with a hyper object. You can't represent it directly. So you end up representing only the parts that individual people experience. But you know, when I think about that, I remember the Columbia ice fields. I remember those little signs. And what I remember is that I had my own experience of this phenomenon back then. But it was mine. It was private. It was that event for me. And everyone in the world is now or will soon be having their own private conversation with the climate. They will have their own experience of global warming. And the vast majority of those people will not choose to frame it the way we in this room are framing. Now, we can turn the volume up on our art. We can, we can do musicals, we can do movies, we can do novels, we can, we, can, we can pound out the message that we have, but it's our message about our intellectualized understanding of what's going on. At the same time, people all over the world are dealing with floods. They're dealing with crop failures. They're, they're dealing with their own private, immediate experiences um, that are real and that we know come from this larger thing. But they will always interpret those events according to the way they were raised, the, their, their own understandings, their community understandings of what is real and what counts as a thing and what counts as an event. So how do you break past that? Um, I don't know if uh, I have the, the answers to that, but I have uh, a possible answer, which is um, that you don't try and represent it all, that you create a new kind of engagement with the world. Um, and this is why we were talking about ambition, um, why it's necessary to be ambitious on the scale of the global problem that we're facing right now. Um, uh, no one's ever accused me of not being ambitious in my writing, and uh, um, I have chosen um, to try and reinvent our most basic understanding of who we are, what we are, and what we are living in as a way of trying to get around the problem that I just described, that each person has their own private experience of something that nonetheless, universally, we share. Um, the, from the standpoint of a working artist, um, I'll say that uh, the, uh, the approach that I've taken is, is a form of frame innovation, reframing the issue. Um, every, every time that we, free, we frame climate change as a crisis, we frame all our reactions to it as things we would rather avoid doing. So this is the, the first hint of how we can start to think differently. What if we didn't do that? What if we found a way to um, reframe the crisis in such a way that our response to it did not have to be something that we do not want to do, something that we would rather not be doing? 
Um, and I'll expand on that. But, um, well, I'll give you an example of that. Um, reframing can be extremely powerful. So about the time that I was gawking up at the Columbia ice fields um, in, in Canada, in the United States, there was a broad bipartisan consensus that uh, universal basic income was a good thing and should be implemented as quickly as possible. It was a concept that appealed to people on the right and it appealed to people on the left for entirely opposite reasons, but that didn't matter. Um, it appealed to people on the right because you could take a UBI and completely eliminate all the costly social government programs um, and just replace them with one check a month. And it appealed to people on the left because it didn't stigmatize the poor. Uh, among other things. Um, as a design solution, you see what that does. It takes what was a political fight over the value of human work, um, the dignity of, uh, of, of, of people, and, and so on and so forth, all of those things, and it simply goes around them and lands somewhere where everyone can say, oh, that's a good idea, let's do that. That is the kind of solution that I'm looking for. I started to look for a solution like that to the climate change problem when I decided to write a near future fiction novel. It was going to be a heist story. It was going to involve um, computer hackers and all this sort of thing. And it was going to be set about 15 years in the future. And when I started to write it, I kept running up against the elephant in the room, climate change. There was literally no way I could tell this story without addressing that problem. Either the world was going to be going to a hell in a handbasket in this novel, um, and in which case everything that my characters did in the novel would be completely trivial compared to it, um, or there was going to be some kind of magical, you know, sweep it aside so that I can tell my story. So I decided, okay. I'll find a way to sweep it aside. Um, I'll design my way out of global warming. Um, the, the book's coming out next month. It's called Stealing Worlds. It'll be out on June 18th. Um, and uh, in it, a, a young woman flees from her, uh, her father's murderers, who are apparently coming after her, too, and hides out in a... Uh, uh, an augmented reality live-action role-playing um, <laughs> system, which is uh, sort of mutating into the new economy of the United States. The book's mostly set in Ohio. Um, so it's, it's strange to begin with. But um, she ends up getting involved with um, these strange entities that I uh, have dubbed Deodans. And this is where the design part comes in. So, uh, Deodan is, a, is an old English word. It comes from old English law, where uh, um, uh, a physical object that had killed someone, like, a, a, let's say, a cart that had rolled over somebody and killed them, would cease to be owned by anyone. Deodan means given to God. It would become its own legal entity that could then be dispersed dispensed with, sold off, and so forth by the state. Uh, my use of the, the idea of Deodan is um, sort of similar. It's an entity that is not owned by anyone. Um, uh, how many of you know about the Wanganui River in New Zealand, which was recently given legal personhood by the state? Um, it's now possible for people to uh, litigate on behalf of the Wanganui River. Uh, how many of you know that this also happened in February to Lake Erie? Um, citizens of Toledo voted to be able uh, to consider Lake Erie to be a 
legal person um, for exactly the same reason, so that they could litigate on its behalf. In some ways, this makes, um, well, it sounds crazy, right? Uh, a forest or a, a, a river as a, as a legal person. It's a movement that's catching on around the world, though, and part of the reason for this is that we already have legal personhood for non-human entities. Uh, we call these non-human entities corporations. So I mash together this concept with uh, a related concept. I've been hanging out with the blockchain community, the people behind Bitcoin and stuff, um, uh, with a concept that came out from them. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, people in the, the crypto community started designing what they called uh, distributed autonomous organizations or distributed autonomous corporations. These were basically algorithms that lived out on the net by themselves um, that could run a company or that could be a company. So a, um, a legal corporation buying and selling owning things, perhaps uh, employing people, uh, but run entirely by algorithm, and those algorithms not controlled or owned by any human being. Uh, there's something called the Ethereum project that's building this kind of thing right now. So what I did for the purposes of the novel um, was say, okay, let's mash these two, two things together. Um, Let's give, take personhood for natural systems and distributed autonomous organizations. And let's imagine, let's imagine an artificial intelligence. It could be a dumb artificial intelligence, but, but something algorithmic that thinks it is the Wanganui River and has access to massive stacks of legal data uh, to resources, maybe to money, that can litigate on its own behalf, that can act as if it were the Wanganui River within the human economy, within our human legal systems. This idea became the Dea Dance in the novel. And by the end of the book, the Dea Dance are basically taking over. <laughs> um, but what is happening is happening under the surface, in a sense. That's the description of um, the sort of science fiction that's going on. But the maneuver that I wanted to pull, that's the important thing. And, and this maneuver is to stop us thinking of ourselves and our technologies as being here, and of the natural world being here and of our great crisis that we are in right now as being us flailing on the helpless natural world, destroying it, savaging it, um, and us needing somehow to stop ourselves from this behavior. There's a problem with you know, the, the Wanganui River being a, uh, a legal entity. Um, or a legal person. Uh, sure, human beings can litigate on its behalf, but that's just the fox guarding the hen house. We, as human beings, cannot solve this problem. We need help. But the world itself is already out there acting. We think of it, because we think of ourselves on this side as um, the instigators, as, as the only agents really acting here, and it as something that's passive or, or purely reactive, um, because we think in, the, in terms of that dichotomy, we can't imagine that the climate, the systems that we're embedded in, not only are um, political actors and economic actors in and of themselves, but are also potential allies. So, so in the novel, getting back to the art here, 
my uh, my main character, Sura, has a revelation at a, a, at a certain point. She meets the Dea Dance, and she realizes that she's encountering something that she's missed her whole life. There has always been a voice that she wanted to hear. There has always been a meeting that she always wished could happen. She has always stood on one side of the glass looking out on something that seemed to be in a, a glorious conversation with itself that she could not touch. And suddenly, that thing is speaking to her. It is the voice that she always dreamed of hearing. The Deodans are that thing that we have always dreamed of experiencing, the literal voice of an awakened nature. When she has this revelation, her entire life changes. But so do all of her commitments. Suddenly all the, the stuff about her father's murder and, and, and trying to get ahead and, and, and get rich and, 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 and get out of the, 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 the terrible situation that she's in, all of it becomes irrelevant. Because suddenly she's not alone anymore. And suddenly she has a focus for everything in her life. She has companions that she needs to protect. And the novel hurdles to its conclusion from, from that. But this is the kind of artistic maneuver that I am talking about, that I think we need to be able to do and that we can do, to take what is um, a, a climactic crisis for the Western viewpoint, essentially, um, that we, as the masters of the earth, suddenly find the earth rejecting us. And to transform our vision of who we are and what it is and what our relationship is in such a way that we can imagine a partnership, um, even a, a, a complete spiritual overturning. Um, and oddly enough, the description that I've just given um, you'll see one of the things I did is that I united technology and nature. There's no distinction between the two by the end of the novel. And it's not that technology is one or that nature is one. It's that the distinction has disappeared. This is the level on which art has to act now. Because anything else we do is just a reproduction of um, the arguments that we've already had. It's an image that we've already taken. It is a, um, uh, a play that we've already seen. We do have to invent new things to survive this crisis. But those things, some of them, are grand ideas. And we have the opportunity to do that now. So I am really happy to be here tonight because I, would, I feel quite honored to be able to invite you guys to take the further step to invent similar grand ideas that can take this crisis from being a crisis to being an opportunity on many different scales and in many different ways for all of us. Um, I, I hope I uh, get to see the results tomorrow. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Carl, thanks so much for this uh, talk. Um, so I came across the hybrid object idea and was very intrigued. And I'm teaching a climate science class to non-science majors. And I immerse them, they get immersed in all the different types of phenomena. Um, and, but it's really hard. I, I, my feeling is, is that by the end they start understanding what you've been talking about but I still have trouble finding ways to communicate that. Um, and, uh, and I still, I mean, with science fiction, I can see this, and I think that's helpful. Um, but any advice on where to go from there or other forms of art um, doing this? It also seems to resonate to me to Zen, 
uh, where um, the reality is beyond conception. Mm -hmm. And conception is a language thing. And then when you think about conception, and we teach knowledge in school and college, that um, these types of hyper objects are beyond conception. But that's actually the first uh, colon of Mu is to overcome that and that realization that nature, nature and reality is this, which is, I think, part of what the hyper object is. And I think you've used an artistic device to communicate this, which is uh, kind of facing this, which is brilliant, but we have to find other ways to do it. So, um, yeah. thank you. Um, well, I, yeah, you've reminded me of what I did not say, which was that I am currently working with um, people in the uh, blockchain community to build the world's first data net. So, yes, this was a piece of science fiction, but it was never just a piece of science fiction. The, the other thing about doing art on this scale is that you have to be prepared um, to make it real. Um, and everything that I just described is possible. Uh, 20 years ago, when I wrote my first novel, Ventus, uh, I descri described something similar. Um, but it was a far future galactic epic uh, with nanotech terraforming systems and all this sort of thing. Um, it's only gradually in the last 10 years that I, I, I came to realize that uh, we are actually capable of building the systems that I'm describing. Um, and in fact, I have most of the design for this stuff worked out. Um, basically, I'm, I'm just looking for a, a large enough corporate or governmental backer for it. Um, so, uh, yeah, you can go. F you, you can go so far with artistic um, uh, explorations, but you have to find ways to engage. You're absolutely right. And I don't have a prescription for how to do that in all cases. But um, uh, but one of the reasons this um, uh, event attracted me is that it is talking about the un unification of art and science. Uh, and I have been very, very careful all along uh, with this particular project to make sure that everything that I describe artistically was something that could scientifically and technically be built. So, Carl, yeah. um, just a follow-up question to that. If you think about the way that we view the world, a lot of it is based on the educational environments um, that we're raised in. And so I'm just curious, how would you redesign the educational experience that, that most of us have as we go through um, elementary, senior, and um, undergraduate, graduate studies to get people to be able to think in a different way? way that's more aligned with what you're talking about because I think a, lar a large part of the problem is the pedagogy that we have and the, and the kind of rational Western Judeo-Christian mindset which has permeated most of the world. So how would you change that in order to get people closer to thinking this way? Well for the particular project that I, I, I described you don't have to and that's the whole point. So uh, early in the book um, Sura just finds that there's this uh, local taxi company called Proudly Eagle Owned. Uh, it's the near future of autonomous cars, so they're not driven by anybody. But she, she flags one down, she gets in, and she drives through destination. It's only much later in the book that she finds out that Proudly Eagle Owned is not referring to an American icon. The cab company is owned by a deodand, specifically one that represents um, a number of families of eagles in the Pacific Northwest. And the profits from the corporation go to preserving and protecting those eagles. Um, she does not need to have any ideological stance whatsoever to have the experience of interacting with those eagles through their commercial entity. Um, and this is the, the specific and I'm having trouble describing it, I realize that. But the specific trick that I want to point to here is short-circuiting all of our current requirements to change people's minds or to change how they behave 
um, by, by forcing them one way or another. Sarah doesn't need any of that. She just takes a cab. But it's a different kind of cab suddenly. Uh, and as the book goes on, these entities just start becoming more and more common around her. Um, no effort is required. Um, and I think it is actually possible to do that kind of thing. Um, sometimes we do it deliberately, sometimes we do it uh, accidentally. Um, the famous Earthrise photo was one of the, 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 the major icons artistically that, that kicked off the environmental movement sort of globally. It was the first time that people had seen the Earth from space as, a, as an object in and of itself. And you could talk about how that image was propagated through the world and so forth, but it's the image itself and the, the fact that no effort is required to have the experience of what it implies that's the important thing. So yeah, we do need to change all our institutions, our educational systems and, and so on. But I don't think that we can put all that hard effort up front in all of those things um, and really succeed at what we're doing. Uh, we have to also do some things that are kind of like spiritual judo, where we just flip the problem um, and uh, make it so that, like Sura, we're just taking a cab. Only it's an entirely new thing in the world. Have you trademarked that, spiritual judo? <laughs> <laughs> It's a bizarre sounding idea now. Uh, <laughs> Hi, um, I have a question for you. I thought your comment about the fusion of nature and technology was really interesting. And um, I think it's a fascinating idea to explore artistically. But to bring it back to like a practical uh, application in society, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on geoengineering. Uh, well, well, okay. It, so it, in, in the novel, when Sarah's having her great crisis about the world, she's in South America, and, she, and, and she's realizing that the world has become a yard. Right? The world is, uh, the, the, the planet is no longer, there's no wilderness anymore. There is only humanity's yard, and it's a yard that we're throwing our trash into. Um, and, uh, uh, that sort of dark moment is also the realization that uh, um, we don't get away with not geoengineering because we're already doing it. Um, the global warming is a massive unplanned geoengineering experiment. Um, and anything that we do is, is part of that, including cutting back on carbon emissions. Um, the the idea that we can get away from tweaking the dials on the, 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 the climate, um, I think, is naive at this point. Anything we do is doing that. Uh, obviously, what we want to avoid is, is getting into a situation where we have to keep doing something indefinitely to keep the world from collapsing. Um, but uh, uh, we, we can't escape the fact that we are in the midst of this, of this thing, we are the cause and we are the cure. Um, so I don't like it, but that's where we are. Does that in any way answer your question? Well, I was thinking more about, you know, the real, I understand what you're saying, that we have engineered our current climate situations completely man-made, but I was thinking more in terms of, you know, carbon sequestration and you know, all of those are out there. They're, they're, they're part of this massive suite of, of interventions. Uh, I think we'll end up deploying, um, you know, dozens of different things, some of which will be labeled as uh, geoengineering. Um, but they're all interventions, one way or another. Um, cutting back on carbon emissions is just the flip side of carbon sequestration. Um, so, uh, I, I'm not a fan of any of these things. I'd like us to discover nuclear fusion tomorrow and then just stop <laughs> with, completely with the, 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 the fossil fuels, but I don't think that's going to happen. 
Um, but yeah, it, 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 everything's tied up in that.